Hello, everyone. This is Richard from Modern Health Span. Changes in the quality and quantity of hair is one of the signs of aging and something that people would like to slow down or reverse. Both Dr. David Sinclair and Brian Johnson are taking steps to preserve or regrow their hair. Let's have a look at the intervention that they are both using. We have more detail on Brian Johnson's protocol as he makes all his information public. We will not cover his entire protocol, but look at the key components of the formulation that he puts on his scalp. He has this formulation custom made for him with these ingredients, two of which are FDA approved interventions for hair loss. The first of these is finasteride, which is present at 0.25% in this serum. As we will see, this is quite a low dose, as finasteride is normally used at a dose of 1%. In an interview, Dr. Sinclair said that he was taking finasteride, which presumably means orally. He said that he was taking it as a precautionary measure, although he did not mention the dose. The second is minoxidil at 5%. This is a standard dose for topical treatment. We will get into these two in more detail in a bit. The other ingredients have some data on them supporting hair growth, but in general, it is not strong. Caffeine, when used topically, does seem to be effective, but there are not many trials for it. Biotin, a form of B7, has some efficacy, especially if you are deficient in B7. Brian also uses a cap with red light sources on the inside, which he wears in the morning. The red light may have multiple effects, but one of them is to stimulate the blood flow in the scalp. This is a major way of supporting hair growth and health and is one of the mechanisms through which minoxidil and also microneedling work. Before we get into more detail on the interventions, a quick look at the common cause of hair loss. The most common is called pattern baldness or androgenetic alopecia. It happens to both men and women, though it tends to be more common and visible in men. In men, it is caused by genetics and male hormones, particularly testosterone and its active form, dihydrotestosterone. There are other forms of alopecia, such as alopecia areata, which causes small bald spots on the head, but we will focus on the most common of pattern baldness. Let's have a look at finasteride first, which is the intervention that both Dr. Sinclair and Brian Johnson are using. I will use this paper a review written in 2021, looking at the use of finasteride for hair loss. They will also pull some data from the reference papers directly. Finasteride started off as a drug for prostate cancer in the 1930s. However, it was found to also reverse male pattern hair loss and was approved by the FDA in 1997. It can be taken either orally or used topically. At the moment, the, only the oral applications are approved by the FDA. According to the previously mentioned study, there was no difference between one and five milligrams oral and the topical use, which would imply one milligram is the optimal dose. Topical use with 1% solutions does also appear to be effective, and there are topical products available with a prescription. Finasteride is absorbed and can have systemic effects when applied topically. There are some papers which looked at the systemic effects of the two methods, and for one of these with a solution of 0.25%, topical reduced the serum dihydrotestosterone about the same as a one milligram dose, though the plasma levels of finasteride were about one-tenth of those from the oral application. Before we get into the details of finasteride, I think the first question is, does it work? So let's have a look at the results. Finasteride can be taken orally or used topically, and it seems that Brian Johnson is using it topically while Dr. Sinclair is taking it orally. This is a forest plot from the review paper looking at four human trials of finasteride at one milligram dose, oral against placebo. The top one is after 24 weeks and the bottom one after 48 weeks. The measure is hairs per square centimeter. And in both cases, finasteride was significantly better. After 12 weeks, there was an average difference from placebo of 12.4 hairs, and after 48 weeks of 16.4. For reference, although there is a lot of variance based on age, ethnicity, etc., the average number of hairs per square centimeter is between 124 and 200. So this is about 6 to 10% of that number. 
Another point is that the placebo group continued to lose hair. And this is the difference between groups, not from baseline. In one of the large studies, the results were visible after three months and continued to improve up to the first year. In another study, it showed an 87% success rate at improving hair in the participants. As there was no summary of topical results in the review paper, and that is what Brian Johnson is using, here is a graph from a similar study of 52 male and female participants comparing topical finasteride at 0.05% solution against placebo. The test was to wash hair and count the number of hairs that came out. So a lower number is better. There was no significant difference for the first three months, but after that, the results diverged with finasteride doing significantly better. At the end, it looks like about 50% better. An interesting point of, from this study is that there was no adverse events reported and serum levels of testosterone, free testosterone and dihydrotestosterone were unchanged. So in summary, it does seem that finasteride is effective in these doses in male and female pattern hair loss. So how does finasteride help with hair health? In male pattern baldness, the presence of DHT, dihydrotestosterone, has been identified as one of the causes of the condition. This is a form of testosterone which binds more strongly to the androgen receptor than testosterone itself. Testosterone is converted to DHT by an enzyme called 5L-alpha reductase, which is present in hair follicles. When testosterone is converted to DHT, it will bind to the androgen receptor, which causes changes in the transcription, which in turn cause the hair follicle to shrink and become less effective at hair growth. Finasteride inhibits 5-alpha reductase, thus reducing the amount of DHT in the scalp. In a 12-month placebo-controlled trial with 1,553 men, finasteride at 1 mg per day lowered serum DHT from 44 to 14 nanograms per deciliter, a 66% decrease. Finasteride is not without side effects, as shown here, including decreased libido in both sexes. It may also cause depression. A couple of notes here. The original dosage was 5 mg per day against prostate cancer, and there were significantly more adverse events at this dose than at the 1 mg generally used for hair therapy. The other is that the finasteride is only approved for male pattern hair loss, but is also effective in women. So let's also have a look at minoxidil, as it is an FDA-approved intervention, and Brian Johnson is using it as part of his formulation. So this review paper is from the same team and published in the same year as the finasteride paper. Minoxidil was first approved as an antihypertensive drug in 1979. Its mechanism of action is through vasodilation, that is, widening the blood vessels. One of the side effects of its use was the growth of hair on the body, which led to it being investigated for hair loss. It was approved for this in 1988 under the trade name Rogaine. Currently, it is approved by the FDA over the counter for topical use at 2 and 5% solutions. This means that it's available from Amazon, unlike finasteride, which requires a prescription. There are no oral formulations of minoxidil approved at the moment, though it is being investigated. This graph is a summary of the results from six trials using 2% solution topically against placebo. It is again based on the hair count per square centimeter, and the minoxidil groups did better by 12.65 hairs per centimeter after 24 weeks, which is similar to the results from finasteride and it had a significant improvement over placebo. In the trials, minoxidil was applied daily. There was one long-term trial of up to five years, which showed a peak of hair growth at one year and then a slow decline. Minoxidil will probably require long-term use to continue to support hair maintenance. In comparing the different doses, 2% and 5% topical were the same. It does seem that microneedling along with minoxidil is more effective than either on its own. But Brian Johnson does not seem to use microneedling on his scalp. Oral minoxidil has been tested, though as mentioned, it is not approved at the moment. 
The review paper does say that five milligram oral is significantly more efficacious than the lower doses of one or 1.25 milligrams. This paper is an open label trial of five milligrams oral minoxidil. The measure was hair count per unit area, the same as in the other tests. There was significant increase in hair count after 12 weeks of 26, and after 24 weeks, it was 35.1. Note, this is from baseline, not from between groups, but it still seems to be about three times more effective than the topical application. Everyone saw an improvement, and 43% were judged to be excellent. However, oral midoxidil does have side effects, particularly hypertrichosis, which is excessive hair growth on other parts of the body, which impacted 93% of the participants. How does minoxidil work? There are four possible mechanisms. The first is vasodilation. As mentioned, one of the reasons that we have hair loss is lack of blood flow to the scalp. And as a vasodilator, minoxidil helps to increase the blood flow in the hair follicles. The second is an anti-inflammatory agent where it reduces inflammation in the hair follicle and helps to promote growth. Thirdly, it induces VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which may play a role in generating blood vessels in the hair follicle and hence improve blood flow. And fourth, it may be an anti-androgen. So like finasteride, it may reduce the production of DHT through inhibiting 5-alpha reductase. Which of these mechanisms is most important does not appear to be clear at the moment. What are the side effects of minoxidil? When taken orally, so having systemic effects, the main concern is growth of hair elsewhere apart from on the head. It looks like there were no trials with women at over 2.5 milligrams per day, but for men at this dose, it impacted 71.8% of the participants. Cardiovascular symptoms were less frequent, but not insignificant. These are due to the vasodilation and include symptoms like low blood pressure and edema, which is a swelling caused by excessive fluid. The main issue with topical application is an itchy scalp. Minoxidil is not absorbed as well as finasteride, and so there are fewer systemic effects when it is used topically, though there can be issues with extra hair growth that, it, that are also seen in the oral cases. The two main solutions do have solid data, at least for preserving the current status of the hair, which seems to be much easier than regrowing, a point that Brian Johnson made and that Dr. Sinclair seems to be cognizant of as he is taking finasteride as a precautionary measure. It's also interesting that some of the herbal solutions such as caffeine seem to work without the side effects, although they lack the studies which have gone into minoxidil and finasteride. And given the lack of monetary incentive, who knows when we will see such studies. But overall encouraging, and certainly Brian Johnson and Dr. David Sinclair seem to be doing well with their hair. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you all well.